real barcode was out in 1974. It was a Wrigley uh, chewing gum bar. And it was the first chewing gum that was actually scanned in 1964 and taking items and products and things into a kind of a digital age. Um, it was coming from a patent in 1994. So in 1994, we had the first patent for something resembling a barcode. And in 1974, 25 years later, we then had this ubiquitous or actually beginning. So when we are now discussing self-sovereign identity for things or for items or products or goods or things, um, in a world of Internet of Things, um, with self-sovereign identity being around seven, eight years old, I guess 2015 was kind of the first, um, the first um, actualizations of it. Um, it looks like we still have a long way to go before this, uh, uh, the promise of this panel, sort of uh, self-sovereign identity, is it needed or vital for the Internet of Things, seems to be... Um, seems to be uh, becoming real. So we have um, three speakers to discuss this topic. We have Carsten Strucker, he's online. And, Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you. You're hearing everything well? Yes, it's loud and clear, perfect. Perfect. Uh, then we have Daniel Desai from EPSI. Morning. And Maria Minirakova from Fetch AI. Good morning, glad to be here. Uh, I was thinking maybe we begin with you, Maria. So, uh, what are your thoughts on 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 the, the the nature of this panel of the question? I think it's a great time to discuss these. Uh, we've already had some very interesting uh, panels yesterday and a very interesting one today about NFTs and the various use cases that uh, people have created. You know, without even thinking, um, you know, about the the underlying technologies, and they're just trying to use it in different cases. So. Um, I'm actually here today representing, or with two hats, uh, representing Fetch AI um, and also representing Move ID, uh, which is a new project that was just kicked off um, last month uh, under the umbrella of uh, Gaia X, which is this large European um, um, data, secure data ecosystem, uh, really, uh, infrastructure. Uh, that we're building. And um, one of the key objectives of Move ID is to enable um, digital self sovereign identity for vehicles uh, and for smart mobility infrastructure. Um, and creating data, uh, data spaces, and uh, through interconnection of data uh, coming from the various mobility devices uh, and, and ecosystem will really lay foundation for, um, for new um, possibilities uh, for new data-related intelligent services, um, enabling people, um, companies, uh, machines, IoT devices uh, with these digital identities, digital sovereign identities, self-sovereign identities, and, uh, and creating or enabling um, sovereign data exchange uh, really uh, will bring new possibilities for data, for, for digital services. Um, in the industrial space, in, um, in medical space, um, in mobility. So um, in, we'll, it, we will see new AI services coming out. Uh, so this is really exciting time, exciting, exciting space. Um, and I'm sure we'll see new business models um, coming as well. Um, and then new use cases that we have not thought about before. So uh, really great time to be here and, and to talk about these things. Yes, I think, I mean, sort of the... We're approaching like 30 billion devices, uh, going into 40, 50 billion devices, and well, there's more, more, um, uh, more, more devices surrounding us than uh, than than people at some time. Sort of all. So, um, naming the names or naming this space, uh, the person who would or the entity who would do that, it it would be something like handing over the keys to the castle. Because so that that would really be. Uh, uh, really be something that uh, GS1 tried to do or did with the barcode and, and RFID. But um, so so going now into this notion of self-sovereign is such a logical moment in time 
when when all of this is happening and it's also timely because because we're we're still we might be able to 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 go there yeah absolutely very timely uh with the improvement in technologies in the edge devices uh we're you know seeing new capacities new capabilities that these devices um, can can do. I mean, looking at our watch, this is one of my favorite examples. Uh, a few years ago, five, six years ago, the watch was there just to measure time, right? Now we use it, even I bought one uh, recently. Now we use it to measure our heart rates to, you know, to help us measure our steps, where we go. And there's loads of other uh, devices or sorry, capabilities and, and services and that we can have now on our watch. And it's just a simple watch, right? And so, um, you know, thinking big, uh, having machines in the Industrial machines and, and IoT devices all over, as you mentioned, 30 billion, that's a lot. So if we can give them identity so we can we can properly identify them. Uh, and then really, I think what is the key is, in addition to that, to really enable this secure uh, data exchange between the devices on peer-to-peer -peer, uh, level uh, will be really, truly fascinating. And um, with more data, we will be able to uh, tap into uh, uh, the underlying, you know, uh, information that that data uh, helps us bring together. And if you have, uh, and, and really to have better AI models, it's about having more and more data uh, collected together and being able to tap into that information and these predictions coming out of that will certainly bring, you know, good business value to the companies. Uh, to citizens, so um, to the society as well. Yes, the the reason why it took so long for the barcode um, to come into existence, twenty five years after the first patent, uh, was not so much the technical issues because it could be done, but it was of course trust. It was because building an ecosystem of stakeholders, manufacturers. Um, services, uh, third-party uh, uh, suppliers, uh, kind of the whole supply chain, had to open up a little bit of data in order for this barcode to to work. And it was this this painstaking stakeholder coordination and ecosystem management that actually brought this barcode uh, to life. I still, I think we we're now in the same position also again a little bit is not so much the technical issues because we have them sort of the models are there and it's working but it's it's uh, trying to create um a, a, a web or a chain of trust between all the players in the ecosystem and the supply chain to to um to understand uh that it, there's is a win 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 for 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 everyone yeah, absolutely. And and trust is one of the key principles of Gaia X. So decentralization, trust, uh, interoperability, these are, you know, some of the key principles uh, uh under which Gaia X, you know, operates or the projects under Gaia X and and that, you know, that's what we're trying to achieve. So trust is definitely one of the the key aspects yeah. or objectives. Yeah. Daniel, since you're you It's indeed a, a big big challenge, yeah? because the self sovereign identity aspect is now being um, I executed or been uh, experimented mainly with citizens, also with organization. But that's uh, it takes time, like Rob has mentioned. It will take time to build that ecosystem, to build stakeholders. But even a bigger revolution or a bigger evolution is coming. Uh, all those things also need an identity. Those things also need to interact with uh, their owners, their consumers, all those aspects. So we need to create that as, and it's even bigger in numbers. So it will be a big challenge. Uh, from my perspective, uh, from the EPSI perspective, we are mainly uh, focusing on the self sovereign identity part, the decentralized identity or the empowerment of citizen organization. But already the, those use cases that extend those kind of things are coming in. Uh, IP management, uh, digital passport, uh, digital product passport, all those things are now coming in. They have looked at old models. They have looked at centralized solution, but they don't work in this world. Huh? This complex world is a complex networked world with many, many actors, with many, many use cases. You cannot not have a centralized or federated aspect. So those people that are exploring those kind of things come in a rather natural way to we need something else. We need decentralized uh, aspects. Huh? It's not about empowerment of those uh, things, but it's the same concept about credentials, about interaction that is needed. Huh? So 
That I think will be, be one of the many, many use cases, many interesting use cases that we need to tackle. Yeah? So don't stick with the self identified individuals, reach out to the next border. Yeah? And also governments will need to took, look at this. Yeah? They have also a lot of uh, assets, or uh, maybe that's a wrong word here, but a lot of uh, components that they manage. And they need to also have an identity that can really interact in multiple contexts. Yeah. Yeah. So, so again, you also agree that it's a good moment in in time instead of um, keeping keeping the focus on self sovereign uh, identity for individuals to broaden the scope and uh, and also take away a little bit the idea of the sovereign, uh, which 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 is sometimes also a difficult aspect in self sovereign. Uh, identity and indeed. and make it more concrete and make it more mundane. Yeah, indeed. Uh, let's it's, let's be clear. Uh, for things, we don't uh, want that they are completely self-sovereign and do whatever they want. They need to be under control of their owner, the people, the organizations that do those kind of things. But the concepts do apply. Uh, that decentralized concept needs, a, and it would be a pity that we start on that a uh, long journey for the citizens uh, self-sovereign identity and forget about the revolution that's coming. Because at a certain moment, they need to interact. You need to interact with your, your car, with your, uh, your home, your house. And if you are doing that in a centralized way, and your identity is in a distance way, those worlds will not connect. So it's an opportunity to, to rethink those kind of things. And again, it, it all also makes sense, because identity is basically becoming three things is is one is what you what you attest yourself about yourself which is basically verifiable credentials and decentralized identifiers um, then it's what your objects tell about you which is which is also becoming part of your identity and the third is basically your behavior because with, uh, with all kinds of models it's it's actual behavior that 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 basically also identifies you. So these, these three things are coming together. So only focusing on, on self-sovereign identity for individuals and, f and forgetting about, about the things is... Um... And maybe one aspect to add, which we didn't name, but of course very important in that empowerment and decentralization, is about privacy. With the current models, all that data from your car, from your home, you don't know what's happening with that. Self sovereign identity brings also a bit the privacy aspects in there that you as owner control also that data. Eh? That your car information, your traffic information is not shared with people that you don't know, that you have at least had as concept. But the current models is not possible, but with SSI, we have a more privacy enabling uh, concept. And that also should be uh, injected, regulated maybe, um, to, for the better good of uh, society in this. Eh? Yeah. Yes. So, Carsten, have you been following the discussion so far? What are your views absolutely. on this? No, absolutely. I think it's a good, good kind of time to pick up some some thoughts. I think uh, Daniel, you said privacy. I think in the business world, people are concerned about business confidentiality, and even from a, from a business perspective, yeah. And um, you also mentioned the barcode, yeah. So there is another barcode that's a serialized version of it, a serialized barcode, which means the barcode usually have a product number, product identification, the GTIN. Then a serialized barcode goes beyond just the product identifier. It, it um, includes the batch number and a serial number. Yeah? And when I have a serialized barcode, a serialized, it's called a serialized GTIN, by the way. If I have a serialized GTIN sitting on a package, let's say a farmer, pharmaceutical package and this is fantastic because now the pharmaceutical package has an identity yeah i know it's a specific product let's say it's aspirin then i know it's coming for a specific batch or specific lot and then i know it has a specific serial number yeah and i can do a lot of things with this i can for example scan it and that's another gs1 um, standard a serialized GTIN being put as a qr code on pharmaceutical packages by the way in Europe, Russia, US, all the pharmaceutical packets, they have um, the serialized barcodes. I can scan it with every phone. And then I need to do a lookup because I want to know, um, is this an authentic um, uh, pharmaceutical product or is it fake? I want to know, was it handled correctly along the supply chain or was it stored in a warehouse with a lot of rats yeah, and I shouldn't use it anymore? 
or I would like to know is, is there a product recall for this product? Yeah. And when I would like to do this, I would I must do a so-called lookup. I scan the serial number and the batch number and the GTIN. Uh, and then I do a lookup, I find a service endpoint of the manufacturer, and then I can send a request to the manufacturer. So requests are typically called product um, verification requests. Yeah? I can send a request to the manufacturer, manufacturer answers. And in this very, very basic workflow, there's a lot of identity involved. First, the identity of the package. And from a, from a, from a business perspective, I don't want to have a centralized lookup registry. Yeah? So when I have the serial number and I look up service endpoint, let's say of Bayer or Novartis or Merck or Johnson Johnson, when I do the lookup of the service endpoint, this is problematic because when I have a centralized um, registry, the centralized registry operator gets all the scanning events in the supply chain. Yeah? And this is extreme, and this would be the Google for supply chain because they get a lot of metadata, which product from which manufacturer was scanned by whom, wholesaler, dispenser, customer, at what time. So this would be the Google of supply chain. For that reason, so people would like to have um, decentralized lookup registries, which means when I, as a wholesaler, do a lookup, I go to decentralized um, distributed ledger node. I do my lookup locally because all the data have been replicated among the different nodes for the lookup. And then I get a response and no one else would see that I have done the lookup transaction. And in addition, so when, when, when I now interact, let's say as a wholesaler, I interact with the, with the manufacturer, I would like to know when I send the, the PI product identity verification request to the manufacturer, so am I really talking to the manufacturer? And this is cyber security. Yeah? Um, is the manufacturer really authorized? That, do they have a license? For example, the smaller manufacturer, do they, by the way, have a license to manufacture pharmaceutical products? And the other way around, before a manufacturer wants to answer in the simple flow, the manufacturer wants to know, um, yeah, does the wholesaler has a license or dispenser to sell the drugs? Yeah. And this, this could be all done with um, decentralized identity, with verifiable credentials in terms of credentializing the license. And this is only a pharma supply chain use case. Yeah? But what's interesting, and then I would like to, to connect it what, what Gartner said in 2015 already, they said the future of supply chain is where we have dynamically defined supply chains, which means uh, I don't know who my supply chain actors and partners are, it's dynamically defined, it's ad hoc, unknown supply chain actors will connect, and this will all happen in a reputation and attention economy. And if you think about dynamically supply chains in pharma, in IoT, it's, 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 it's many orders of mag magnitude more, more, more complex. If I think about all these use cases, I need a decentralized thing to, to, uh, to, to do lookup, to authenticate my counterparty, to authorize my counterparty, and this has less, a lot, of, lot to do with um, uh, legal compliance. And this also has a lot of, to do with um, cybersecurity. And for that reason, um, the technology is extremely important. And last sentence, so when I authenticate and authorize my counterparty and I do it on a resource level, this is, this is the crown jewel of um, API endpoint security and API endpoints that's the biggest vulnerability in, in, yeah, in terms of cyber attack surface. And for that reason, the technology and the usefulness goes beyond interoperability and value chains and, and whatever. It's, it's, it's a key component of um, cyber secure systems as well. Thank you, Carsten. So basically you're saying that we already have a lot of building blocks and we should also look at what we have now, for example, these serialized barcodes and see what we can what we can use and um, and uh, sort of so we're not starting from scratch we can use all these building blocks well, absolutely i think the problem here is and it's a quote of one of the other key ssi people um, he said hey the ssi access has a self inflicted pain yeah because we have all the building blocks but we have all the building building blocks in different variations in different implementation patterns and this confuses people a bit. Last week, I had a call uh, in our project ID Union. So we invite experts from all around the world 
from South Korea, and the guy explained us how they did extremely pragmatic decisions to roll out 35 million wallets for COVID certificates in South Korea, SSI wallets. Extremely pragmatic, no self-inflicted pain, like, hey, I have all different kind of technology stacks and, and standards and protocols. They basically choose the right, of course, for, for different building blocks, they choose one of these standards, one of the protocols, very pragmatic, rolled it out to 35 million people. I think they issued a couple of hun hun 300, 400 uh, um, COVID certificates, and they did in the order of magnitude 1 billion and more um, COVID certificate verification transactions in South Korea at scale and round trip of a, um, a, a, a COVID certificate verification was 200 milliseconds built on SSI. So which means technology is there, building blocks is there. I think it's kind of, let's say, called I think we've lost you, Kirsten. Kirsten was basically saying the same. We have the technology, we have the building blocks, so we need... Uh, uh, Kirsten is right. We need standardization at a certain level. We have too many flavors and things, too many protocols, too many things. It's not that one will rule them all, but at least you need interoperability and you need some kind of standardization. If not, this will not uptake. Then you say regulators or governments or big organizations say, okay, it's a too diverse landscape with too many actors. I cannot act in those kind of things, right? or I need to build my own solution. So Carson is right that you need something more pragmatic to say, okay, how does this work? Because the concept is already there, but the too many flavors is a bit uh, problematic at this moment. Huh? Yeah. And, and and what's what's EPSI doing uh, or, or trying to do about about this? Or uh, well, I, I, what EPSI trying to do is, of course, I also standardize it the way. So standardize a certain way. Of course, we follow the standards that are there, all those verified credentials, the DITs. But we also needed to choose an uh, an implementation, uh, one flavor of that aspect. But what we want to do is, of course, reach out to other stakeholders to see, okay, how is it interoperable with your solution? No? We have also invested a lot in wallet conformity testing, reaching out to different solution providers to see, okay, is our solution compatible with your implementation? No? It took some time, of course, to align those kind of things, but it was a, a necessary exercise. No? One of the biggest challenges that we will face in the near future is, of course, how the SSI wallets that uh, handle all those verified credentials will be interoperable in a way with that hybrid um, European digital wallet. Huh? That will also be a very important aspect. We need to be sure as a SSI community that we also interoperable to it, uh, those concepts. Huh? Mm -hmm. So there's also a very active uh, uh, policy line of action line to align with those uh, initiatives. Huh? Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I, again, Epsi is one of the players in the ecosystem. So with Carsten, also with Gaia X, with ID Union, we need to agree because for citizens and organizations, they need to have a stable answer and they need to know how these things connect with each other. So that's also a very important action to reach out to these different uh, initiatives. And the digital um product passport uh, sort of is that is that something that we can leverage or that that can as a that is one of the leverage? use cases that is now emerging uh, we have uh, from in the commission and from in the different organization there are currently projects on the digital product to passport so that will be uh, is an interesting case they of course need to rely on a stable infrastructure to deploy them uh, if not they will tend over to go okay let's try to build this even in a centralized way so we are now merging, doing the switch towards decentralized aspect, and that is needed. I like Carsten has mentioned that eh? it's too broad ecosystem with the magnitude of uh, interactions. So they need to go to that direction. Eh? So the first talks are there, the first uh, initiatives are there, but now they need the extra push to say, okay, it's not a proof of concept. It's something that you really can deploy, eh? yeah. and that is of course in collaboration with many many actors. Eh? Yeah.
So Maria, is it, is it? Oh, Carson is back there. Yeah. So, um, the, are you also searching for the, or looking? Uh, are you think standardization is the key? Yes, yeah, standardization is, as was mentioned, one of the key uh, key aspects or key you know needs uh, that needs to be established. But I believe that uh, you know interoperability in it's equal with interoperability. Mm -hmm. Because you will always have, uh, I don't think we're going to have one blockchain that rules them all. There will be several different, you know, ecosystems. So, for example, Move ID has uh, ecosystems uh, built on, on Polkadot, on Cosmos, on EVM. So you have uh, lots of players. Uh, this is a heterogeneous uh, ecosystem, right? And, and you want to keep it that way, yeah. um, not just on the blockchain level, but then you have different uh, OEMs, uh, manufacturers of, of vehicles, manufacturers of, of IoT devices. They all need to be able to select their right ecosystem and then be able to uh, be interoperable with others and um, you know, share or, or share uh, the, the verified credentials you know, anonymously um and also share the data uh in a private secure way right so so these are i think the the key principles that we all agree on and then now what we have are several initiatives in europe that are are really going further and and trying to bring this into from the poc state into something where we can show that and that this is now um sort of uh, like this should be the roadmap how we bring it to life actually and then start using it in in our hopefully daily lives at some yeah. point yes Carson are you back yeah yeah okay yeah ma maybe I can add um because you're saying that losing our daily lives so in the US pe people are kind of pushing this into operations in the pharma supply chain and um they by the way standardized it with GS1 in GS1 there's a secure supply chain working group yeah and basically, in GS1, we said, hey, let's use credentials to make our supply chain systems even more secure in terms of authenticity, integrity, and authorization of the trading partners. And I think that's also important. We don't need to wait for further regulations. There is already a lot of regu compliance regulations. So where this technology plays a major role in terms of yeah, using electronic signatures for integrity, authenticity, non repudiation, attributability, and a lot of other features. And I think it's also for the, for the people building solutions to really look in the individual domains, look for the compliance requirements and kind of push forward to put a viable ecosystem together. So where people start to use yeah, electronic signatures, decentralized identifiers, verifiable credentials to really make sure we automate compliance. This could be done today. And yeah, this, this this requires a bit of domain knowledge and of course um, the the um, yeah, ability to engage the complete ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, um, if I can ask, sort of, the, what what is it that you're lacking most at the moment in 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 the, the work you're trying to achieve? So I particularly look forward to having the Data Act uh, finalized and, and brought to life uh, because I think that will push a lot of the manufacturers uh, of, of devices, of machines, of, of vehicles to open the data ecosystem. And then we will really need this identity to help us uh, enable this communication between the devices, us to the devices and devices, uh, machines to machine uh, communication and machine to machine economy. And I, I see this, this will really open up uh, and and bring these uh, these use cases to life much faster. So I'm I'm looking forward to that to having yeah. that. Yeah, I think with the the Data Act, the Cybersecurity Act, the Cyber Resilience Act, I think the Identity Act is sort of is sort of still missing a little bit. So we need need sort of to see that uh, coming. So well, Daniel, indeed, the Identity Act now is seen as the IDAS aspect and the EU digital identity. But the identity is more broader than that. Right? It's a combination of uh, the IDAS and the Data Act and all those kind of things and citizens aspect. So there needs to be a bigger vision, huh? not only a technology vision about, okay, how do you see this wallet? It's also about, okay, how do we handle the identity? And it's, I, I don't see much discussion on the regulatory or parliament aspects. For, okay, what does that mean to be a, that things have an identity which they interact? Nobody's having that discussion. We are hardly having that discussion, to be honest, uh, for a citizen. 
but it needs to be okay how does the, uh, the aspect do they have rights do they have certain aspects uh, who is controlling those and things because things will outlive c- uh, certain owners so it needs to be t- taken care of so on the rector you aspect you need i uh, still some work to be done huh? but of course i as mentioned in the discussion before don't over aggregate at this moment because we are now in, in emergent technology and emerging concepts it needs to still to grow and um, to prove itself into the real context. Huh? Yeah. So, Carsten, sort of, uh, if, if I may ask a last question. So, what what is it that you're lacking most in your work now and the things you're trying to achieve? Yeah, I would I would like to go back to the um, digital product passport that also Daniel talked about. Yeah, so digital product passport. If you look in the regulation on the BAF policies, it shall be a verifiable digital product passport. And that's interesting because then you see the provenance of your components that being assembled in the products, and you see the ESP compliance of your suppliers and so on. And but this only works if you have if you have a digital backbone, a digital backbone with standards and identity, credential, signatures where everyone is kind of connected to and where everyone applies the standards, which means when policymakers put new policies in place, such as eco design for sustainable products, digital product passport, supply chain law, and so on, I think the the policymakers must think about when they when they draft the policy, endorse it, how will the digital backbone being kind of developed and deployed? Because only if the policy can be monitored, audited, and enforced at scale on a transaction level. I think then it will be effective if there's no digital backbone, like um, big four accountant comes in once a year, checks some paper, puts a stamp on it, then there's plenty of greenwashing. Yeah? And for that reason, I think in the future, and that's that's kind of what, what, what I'm asking for in terms of addressing a lag. So when policies are endorsed, let's also think about the digital backbone and let's put the actions in place to accelerate the implementation of the digital backbone because if we don't do it, we put a policy in place today and we might have a digital backbone in 10 years from now and then it's for late, too late and then we also lose our, let's say, reputation from the policymaker side if we cannot enforce it in scale. And that's, I think that's, that's, that's a big ask. So when we do policy, think about the digital backbone, accelerate its implementation and then you have an effective policy that can be enforced at scale. And I think that's 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 the most important um, point from my point of view. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we've also reached the end of this panel, so can I have a big applause for my speakers. <laughs>